What's happening to you these days? Having lots of fun? Believe me, I know some folks that are in for some fun. <laughs> Take a minute. See what's in it. But you can see how dangerous this could be. But first, we're going to have a little fun tonight, folks. It's time for the Geeky Rummy Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Geeky Rummy Podcast. Joining me today, your host, Mr. Ryan Parrish. Well, that's me. It's Mr. Keith Bloomfield. Live long and prosper, Ryan. It's Mr. Lee Price. Hello. And Mr. Matt Lovell. Hello. It feels like it's been a long while since we last recorded our three-hour mammoth <laughs> fifth birthday special. I think we needed a break after that. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully our audience have managed to listen to all of that by the time this goes live. Um, it's been a fun few weeks. How have we all been? Keith, what have you been up to? Um, I was extending my Mario course. Um, so I've recreated the entirety of uh, Super Mario um, Land, or whichever one was on the Super Nintendo. I haven't really, but I thought about it, and then I kind of realised <laughs> I hadn't got enough toilet rolls. Um, and that would be an epic project. Uh, so instead, I've just tried to rebuild um, Super Mario Land in, in Animal Crossing, because as part of their Mario celebration, they put a bunch of Mario things in. Mm-hmm. Um, so it gave me cause to revisit um, Animal Crossing and annoy all of my neighbours by going, yeah, I've got to move your house so I can make a Mario course. <laughs> um, they're not too happy about that, but still, you know, it's a Mario, it's fine. Yeah. Um, and that, 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 other than that, not a lot. Lockdown, kind of like, you know, trying to figure out what, what I'm going to do uh, when I'm not stuck at home all the time. Um, but I, just reading a lot of digital comics as well. So that's been quite nice. Yeah. Um, so that a lot of stuff that I, I don't own anymore, which I wanted to reread. So I kind of revisited some classics um, yeah. online, which is quite nice because there's, there's yeah. lots with comicsology and stuff on there. You got a lot of um, a lot of things accessible, which is quite nice. Yeah, I was going to say for Amazon Prime subscribers, I think House of M is currently free on the Kindle reading service. Uh-huh. Like you know, one of those books you can check in and out. So anybody who's watched Wonder Vision. Good chance to catch up and get a bit of the backstory. Yeah, and of course I was doing that. I was watching One Division, um, mm-hmm. which has been highly enjoyable. Because uh, I think since we last spoke, we, we finally finished that season. Yes, um, which I was very happy with. Um, really, really nice bit of TV. Looking forward now to um, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been seeing lots of people online upset about One Division that it like all the expected crossovers didn't happen. It's like, well, they never promised these in the first place. Yeah, that's the trouble with social, ah, social ah, media. The, Ninten- the Nintendo Direct expectation <laughs> yeah. syndrome. Okay, yeah. I don't, I don't think it helped that every week random news sites would just go in, here's a new theory, and just print in any old cobblers yeah, um, yeah. to like go, yeah, uh, in the next episode, the entirety of the Fantastic Four and the X-Men are going to drop by because they're living in the house across the road and they don't know that they, they live there and then Doctor Strange is going to come and then all of this is going to happen and then it's all going to be... And it's like, no, no, it's, it's not. That's not going to happen. It's just wild, wild speculation to get clickbait. Most, most of the articles are yeah. like, you'll never guess what's going to happen. And you read the article and you go, eh, I could probably guess that was never going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> these Wonder Vision characters may shock you. Yeah. Read more. <laughs> yeah, it's like comics that inspired the series, and they just pick any old random nonsense. Yeah, yeah. here's one it's Scarlet Wish issue six hundred, which yeah. has nothing to do with the actual show. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was kind of like yeah, that, all that wild speculation. It reminded me a little bit about the, the, the time between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Um, but then I had to wait a month to go and read an issue of Starlog where they had an article that somebody had actually researched with wild speculation about what was going to happen in Return of the Jedi. Um, yeah. But yeah, otherwise it's just kind of clickbait for one division. Um, yeah. Which was, which was, you know, I was happy to watch the story they wanted to tell me. No, I think it worked out really, really well. I really enjoyed the ending as it was, and it's definitely left things open for another season. Especially with Tip X Boy floating around somewhere on his own. Yeah, I, I was very happy with the fact that it kind of got the action bit out of the way, and the final moments of it focused on them as a family. Yeah, um, I really, I really like that. There was that whole bit, um, a little bit kind of like David Tennant's Doctor Who finale. That sense of like, yeah, well, this is ending, 
and we know it. Yeah. And I, I, it was kind of a really emotional gut punch, and I was like, "This, this is really sad." But it was highly mm. enjoyable. Highly enjoyable. Spoilers, by the way, if anybody hasn't watched it yet. If you haven't, yeah. why not? Mm-hmm. It's like you're reading all about it on the internet. I mean, I think that was majority spoiler free there. I don't think there yeah. was any kind of like. It, it ended. It ended, yeah. <laughs> it ended. <laughs> and it, it, it had an ending, Keith. Man, I can't yeah. watch it now. <laughs> yeah. It had an ending, and there's going to be another series. There we go. That's <laughs> uh, Lee, what have you been up to since we last spoke? Very good question, because um, like I can't even like list any sort of major games that I've been playing because a lot of what I've been playing has been recording purposes, um, some of which I can't say just because I want to keep it secret what I'm doing. Uh, and um, but yeah, like I've got just general bits of footage coming together, um, and one particular game that's going to be getting an episode of Chapter Select in April. Uh, which has taken the best part of a year to record all the footage for. Um, yeah. So maybe that would be a clue. I don't know. Um, but um, no, it's been kind of just lots of video work, really, mostly. Um, I have played around. It's funny because, like, obviously you mentioned about wild speculation. It made me think of, obviously, Smash Brothers. And there has yeah. been a new fighter put added to Smash Brothers. They've been yeah. trying that out. Um so I got the fighters pass. It's um, Pyra and Mithra from Xenoblade Two, which of course led to all the people online being very upset because they were it's expecting them. it to be Doom Guy or Master yeah. Chief or whoever else. And uh, no, say, it's, isn't it? It's another sword-based character. Which it's an anime awesome. sword fighter. Yes, <laughs> that's um, all it ever is now. But it's but it's a girl this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, but actually, is a, is genuinely kind of a fun character, and I didn't enjoy Xenoblade Two. I found that um, it kind of leaned into the worst kind of anime tropes for the most part of it. So like, there would be a serious scene, and the camera would just casually pan over to a character's breasts, and that would happen like every other scene. And you'd just be like, "Yeah, okay, we get it. They they've got they've got breasts. Good." It's um, definitely a Japanese RPG. Yeah. Is the, you know. yeah. <laughs> Which is it's, it's ridiculous because Xenoblade 1 didn't have any of that. So I don't know why Xenoblade 2 suddenly had all this. And it also had the jarring thing of the villains were all designed by Tetsuya Nomura of Square Enix and does all the Final Fantasy stuff. And you could tell because the art style for the villains was completely different to everybody else. Um, <laughs> and um, But yeah, it's actually a fun, fun character to play as. It's basically like the... It's two characters in one, so you can... It's sort of like Zelda and Cheek back on back in the yeah. melee days, um, but um, like one of them is they basically got the same move set, but one of them's faster, one of them's more powerful. That's how they've worked it out. Um, just, so it's, uh, depending and, on the situation, basically. Mm-hmm. And as someone who tends to prefer the speedier characters, my choice tends to be Mithra. Um, but uh, we had the announcement from Sakurai, which of course had him with his figures of the characters sitting on his desk. And saying like I, oh, you know, we, I buy these figures so that we can like, you know, get like a good reference point for the characters, in, including the bottom of their feet, which of course led to tons of internet jokes about how much yeah. Sakurai likes feet. Yeah. <laughs> Not that he was peering up the skirt at all. Yeah. No. Uh, he did. He did sort of stare at one of them for a while and go, like, "My favorite is is Pyra for her combat abilities." <laughs> yes, as a fighter. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. I always love those presentations. They they just no matter who it is, it's always just an entertaining half an hour or so of just Sakurai nerding out about video games and just yeah. having a good time. So. You think he'd like be exhausted with his audience by now of just like <laughs> just just go away, people. <laughs> it's, it's, How many more fighters do you want? Yeah. It's it's the meme that I've seen going around of just his face with the caption, Don't ever ask me for anything ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I'm trying to think. Wouldn't like Master Chief or Doom Glow work better in a, like a Soul Caliber game? So they have like a history of having I exclusive think, console characters. I think there was. Um, it wasn't Master Chief, but there was like another sort of Spartan. I think created yeah. specifically for Dead or Alive. Mm. So it was like a weird crossover there. 
I, I can't remember the specifics of it, but I know that's just something at the back well, of my mind. Like some it, sort of Halo crossover with Dead or Alive. Was it Dead or Alive beat Volleyball? And no. <laughs> it was one of the actual fighters. Just Matt although, Keith in full armour playing beat Volleyball. It, it was a female Spartan, so they could have put her into, into that. <laughs> in the full armour. Just just make it bikini style, so you just you see a midriff, and that's it. <laughs> the rest you, know, is... you know the Dead or Alive rule, like... It needs ducal physics, otherwise it's not going to be in Dead or Alive. Yeah. Yeah. Master Chief with jiggle physics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's worse, that or a brute with jiggle physics. <laughs> um, but, the, but yeah, I mean, like, the thing about... Like, Master Chief isn't going to get into Smash Brothers. The only reason the two... Like, because I think there is, like, a rule that they have to have been on Nintendo systems at some point. Yeah. Um, which is not the case with Halo and I think with um, Doom Guy, Bethesda have explicitly said Doom Guy isn't getting in and yet people can still go, maybe this time he will, it's like, no, Pete Hines of Bethesda has explicitly said they spoke to Nintendo yeah. and it went nowhere. <laughs> yeah, it's like, who would want this 18 rated game character whose, whose games are just about gore and pulling yeah. things apart in a, in a cutesy fighter book? I mean, Bayonetta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... I mean, they had to tone down the, the nudity, but yeah, she's still there. It does make me wonder: is if if there's any room for Smash Brothers to have a Lego minifigure character with with a, and so you you, you could we may change Steve from Minecraft. Yeah, He's that's... already in there. <laughs> yeah, but the Lego figure could be anybody. You could re- rebuild him, so he could be anything. Like in, in like in a leg, regular Lego game, I mean, you could get what's his name from the Lego movie in there. He's a builder. <laughs> I think yeah. the the general rule is they have to have been a video game character that's been on the Nintendo system. I, I'm sure the Lego movie video game was definitely available. <laughs> on There's the Nintendo been system. Lego games on the <laughs> Nintendo system. Yeah, but it, it, <laughs> they're yeah. licensed. Was it's, was uh, what was it? What was that p- toy to life game? I always keep thinking I should have got that. Skyland. No, the Lego one. Uh, Lego Dimension. Yeah, that's it. So everybody's been on in Nintendo then. Ghostbusters, Scooby Doo. Um, <laughs> the, the door's wide open. Doc Brown and Marty McFly. I think that would a be good a good question. one for yeah. Smash Brothers. They could drive in on a DeLorean. Telltale switch. Games version. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you could have the Telltale Games version. But uh, that's an interesting article, probably to circle back around to someday. What happened to all like Skylanders and Disney Infinity and all those games? Because they like they were massive for like a decade and then have evaporated since. Uh, so weirdly, I watched a really long YouTube documentary on it. I don't know why, <laughs> <laughs> but it basically went the same way as Guitar Hero and all the other plastic instruments of the time. It just got. Everyone and their mum started doing it. There were way too many, and the mar- the market just imploded. Yeah, and, and too expensive, presumably as well. You'd think this is a this is a thing that um, Funko would have got on board with now because they they could they could do the Toys to Life game or the the genre mm-hmm. of game, and so each figure comes with a scannable code which would unlock a character in a game. I mean, because they've literally got everybody, so you could play a video game as the Golden Girls. <laughs> You know, how, how much fun would that be? Be Arthur with a massive hammer, just yeah. It. So you know, there's a there's a thing there. I mean, I imagine the licensing for that it would be horrendous. Well, but you know, I I'm well, now all... in regard in regards to that. As far as I'm aware, there's only been one Funko game, and it did not succeed very well. Um, <laughs> I think there's was... one of those terrible mobile match three games, which is where they probably earn more money from that. There was a. Gears of War tie-in for mobile, and it was all Funko style. Yeah, and it got shut down within a year because no one played it. So, yeah. but I mean, if you advertise the game as play as the Golden Girls, <laughs> the, 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 uh, it's, money's going to just come flooding in, isn't it? It's like you know there, and 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 you know, I'm sure there'll be other people yeah. that want to play as other characters, but I don't think there is any license that that Funko haven't got yet. Uh, yeah, I like I like that idea. So I haven't got any of the Anderson stuff yet, Jerry Anderson stuff. That's their last licensing opportunity. From <laughs> <laughs> they're saving Thunderbirds till very last. But that <laughs> <laughs> Matt, what have you been up to the last few weeks? Um, other than desperately needing a haircut. 
uh, <laughs> I've been... Um, so first up, I've been playing this really nice game called Concrete Genie. Um, it was free on the uh, PlayStation Store for last month now. Mm-hmm. And um, I went into it with sort of no expectations whatsoever. I was just bored to put it on. And I was actually blown away. It's such a awesome game. Um, so to give you sort of the premise, it's kind of um, this young boy in this old part of this old town that's been abandoned and it's now polluted and full of sort of like... Um, vagabond youths and that kind of thing and effectively he's got a massive drawing book full of all these sort of creatures he's created um and he gets jumped by some bullies they rip up his book scour it to the winds and he's effectively going through um the city um and bringing his characters to life through drawing on surfaces and that kind of thing and um it's really unique art style it's quite similar to like kubo in the two strings that kind of stop motion um kind of representation and its mechanics are you use um the six axis of the ps4 controller to actually paint and design the characters yourself based on sort of like templates that kind of thing and the overall thing is just really cute it's just it's something I, you really need these days just something really nice and cute um so if you've actually downloaded it, I would say go play it. It is well worth it. I have in fact downloaded it because um, I knew about the game when it came out. <laughs> when it came out, and um, but I was like, I've got a lot of other games to play, but I'll download <laughs> it so I can so I can claim it, and then I'll get around to it at some point. <laughs> I would say play it as a break because mm-hmm. you can play it for for just just a short time, but it mm-hmm. just makes you feel really nice, it's really chill as well. You can just kind of zone out and just play it. Mm-hmm. So it was a game I did have my eye on, but unfortunately it was a PlayStation exclusive, I believe. Yep, I think so. Yeah, published by Sony. Yeah, it's a real, it's a real shame when when games of that quality come out and you just go, oh, yeah. Reason, reason well, to get myself a P- PS4 when they were all being sold for peanuts. Yeah. Well, we're going to get some revenge at some point from Microsoft, I think, with Bethesda. <laughs> <laughs> now, now the purchase has gone through, and they've changed from oh, our games are from everyone to. Some games will be exclusive. Yeah, I know that cl- that qualifier <laughs> of some games. Yeah, which probably is going to be Starfield and mm-hmm. whatever the next. Is it Elder Scrolls is owned by them now? So, yeah, you have uh, uh, Elder Scrolls Six will be coming out. Yeah, in about four true. years, <laughs> at least. <laughs> I think we should lay some money down on what what's going to be next: GTA Six or Elder Scrolls. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would honestly put good money on like Elder Scrolls coming first, just for the simple fact that with GTA 6, as long as GTA Online is still rolling in tons of money, they're yeah. not going to make GTA 6. They don't care. <laughs> I, I assume they're just like, it's it's a bit like Valve now at Rockstar. They just turn up, sit on their thrones of money mm-hmm. and play mobile games on their phones. <laughs> yeah. yeah, basically all the staff that work there are just there to add stuff to GTA Online. That's it. That's all yeah. they do. Occasionally, they'll put out a Red Dead every ten years. Yeah, I'm still I'm wait, still waiting for Rockstar plays Table Tennis Two. To be honest, <laughs> I always forget that exists, and then I'm reminded, and I'm just like, that was a thing, and they did put their name on it because yeah. you know that's what you that's what you wanted out of Rockstar. It was actually a very good Table Tennis. I'm sure thing. it was. It was just bizarre. <laughs> But also, it had, it had like an amazing, really high octane trailer as well. It made yeah. like pinball, like sorry, table tennis look so, so amazing. <laughs> From the people who bought you Grand Theft Auto, Rockstar presents table tennis. <laughs> I think like some, of the other like... stuff, some of the other stuff they were putting out at the same time was like you had like Manhunt and you had Bully and stuff, and all yeah. that fit in with GTA, and then suddenly table tennis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised I don't have table tennis as one of the options on GTA Online, to be honest. <laughs> Probably you'd, is in there somewhere. Go you'd perhaps. expect it to have been like, just reuse the code from that. <laughs> but anything else, Matt? Anything exciting? Um, I wouldn't say it was exciting, but the only other thing is I've been getting hyped for the uh, Dota anime on Netflix. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Dota Dragon's Blood. Um, it's coming to netflix of at the end of this month and it's 
I'm excited about it because obviously it's Dota. I love Dota, but it's actually got quite a um, a strong pedigree behind it. So it's um, the studio sort of producing it um, are the same who did the Legend of Korra um, animation, that kind of thing. And um, it's got obviously like Troy Baker uh, voicing and a couple of other sort of like well-known sort of voice actor names. So I think it's going to be quite interesting. And also this is kind of the biggest in terms of extended media Valve has done for um, for Dota, not including the sort of Steam exclusive documentary uh, free to play around the pro scene. Mm. So it's just quite interesting. And I think compared to other MOBAs as well and other kind of sort of games, that kind of thing, um, they are sort of the first to branch out to that. Um, so in terms of like League of Legends and Riot and Smite, etc., they've done similar things with other breakout games, comics, that kind of thing. But Valve were the first one to produce a sort of anime. So it'll be interesting also to see what how that feeds into the main the main game and how that um, sort of impacts the rest of the whole sort of like Dota scene. Very interesting. Uh, it's coming to Netflix, I believe. Yes. I uh, don't know the actual date. I think it's towards the very end of March. Yeah. I mean, if it's the same level as the Castlevania anime that I'm doing, I'll be very happy. Very Castlevania vibes as well, which is yeah. quite good. I do, I do enjoy that Netflix seems to be just determined to take every video game and turn it into a big <laughs> anime. Because <laughs> they did, they'd like release the, what is it? Um, the Capcom thing, I think it is. Dragon's Dogma. Dragon's yeah. Dogma, that's the one. Yeah. They did that, and then like I know that they, I think they've said they're doing a Devil May Cry one. Mm. I've heard that. Yeah, and I think, and I think it is the same director as Castlevania doing that one. I, um, I'd, I would love them to do a Metal Gear Solid one, so I don't want to actually have to play the games because they can <laughs> recycle all the cutscenes. Metal, the- Metal Gear Solid is already an anime. Let's be honest. <laughs> be <It'd> be nonsensical. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they could just like intersperse footage of somebody just walking from one place to another place in a cardboard box, and then just transition to the next scene. It's good. look. Here's the thing about Metal Gear: it's got giant robots, it's got cyborg ninjas, and it's got long, long essays about philosophy and politics it's an anime <laughs> <laughs> so what about you ryan what have you been up to uh it's been a bit quiet myself to be honest uh been quite busy at work so not much social planning time but um bake bake off's restarted so watch that stand up the candidate bake off mass chef's on so the tweet, tweeting account for Brimby Gourmand's been revived, mainly for me to just to abuse Greg Wallace on, <laughs> on social media quite frequently. And they've started watching 90210, which I am not party to, but I am also watching due to the fact that it's in the same room. Is this the but, original, yeah. not the remake? It's the original one, the 10 season one, because I bought the box set for, I think it was for her birthday last year. But, um, Due to licensing, all the music's being changed. So Viv keeps expecting like singles from the from the era to appear, and then some generic music starts off, and she's like, "What?" <laughs> yeah, it's quite interesting to see like how much they've had to change stuff due to licensing costs. So don't, it's, it's not actually available on DVD in the UK. I had to source it from Germany while we were still inside the EU, luckily. But um, yeah. It's just like oddness with, as as Keith knows, physical discs and acquiring them in the UK sometimes is near on it impossible. Yeah, and the the random licensing because I had a similar problem with the DVDs for a show called Northern Exposure, mm-hmm. which again the music was integral to to the mood and the the pacing of that. And when they released it on DVD a few years back, um, they took out a load of the actual songs and replaced it with random music, which just killed certain scenes dead. Um, but a recent Blu-ray release that's just come out in the last 12 months has actually replaced it all. Um, so I kind of want to get that. I think when it came out, it was a little bit pricey. Um, mm. So I'm hoping at some point it will come down in price a little bit. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm just keeping an eye at the minute. There's, there's other Criterion collection stuff and a few bits I want to pick up. But again, US only, which is a big problem unless you're in 4K, which is region free. Yeah. 
some of the arrow stuff's a bit like that as well because they've mm-hmm. had, they've had um additions of more rats and a last the uh, last starfighter that we didn't get in the uk yeah. which seems like a real shame typical uh, missed opportunities yeah. it shows you it shows you how little i buy physical dvds now that like as soon as you said oh it's, it's us only i was like well that's not a problem everything's region free now and i realized i was thinking about games not dvds <laughs> <laughs> well there's some it's weird because there's still stuff that's coming out that doesn't come out i've, I've been trying to hunt down a, a movie called love and monsters which came out in america last year end of last year i just can't find it anywhere in the uk on the streaming services or anywhere um, which which is a real shame because I do want to watch that at some point. So. Yeah, yeah. It's surprising how many movies get uploaded in full to YouTube. Not that what I would suggest that for copyright reasons, but it always does surprise me when I'm watching my YouTube stuff and full movies just appear randomly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, for long, <laughs> <laughs> moving swiftly on from that subject, uh, coming up today on the show. We're going to be talking about one of Netflix's new releases, Space Sweepers, which is a Korean space opera, which has a real strong anime vibe to me. Uh, We'll be talking about another cult movie from some time ago, which has a very polarizing audience, which was Kung Pao Enter the Fist, which is nearly 20 years old. Uh, Keith will be giving us the comics pull list, and Lee will be giving us our gaming update. But we'll see you in a second. Now it's time to take a look at some of the comics out now and coming soon in the pull list. First up, we have Berserker number no. one from Boom Studios. This is written by Matt Kent with help from the actor Keanu Reeves. And art on this is by Ron Garney. In this issue, the man only known as Berserker is half mortal and half god, cursed and compelled to violence, even at the sacrifice of his sanity. But after wandering the world for centuries, Berserker may have finally found a refuge, working for the US government to fight the battles too violent and dangerous for anyone else. In exchange, Berserker will be granted the one thing he desires, the truth about his endless, blood-soaked existence and how to end it. Also out now is The Dreaming Waking Hours number 8 from DC Comics Black Label. This is written by G. Willow Wilson with art by returning artist Nick Robles. It's The Fairy King Part 1. The next major arc of The Dreaming Waking Hours begins here. Heather After has a theory about just where Ruin's lost love might be found, but the realm of fairy is a dangerous place under the best of circumstances. And as Heather, Ruin and Joffia will quickly find when they cross between worlds, the circumstances there have changed quite a bit. Don't miss this jumping on point for the series The Hollywood Reporter calls a contemporary version of what Gaiman had achieved with The Sandman. Also out now we have Carmen number one from Image Comics, written and illustrated by Gillam March and with an English translation by Dan Christensen. Spanish writer and artist Gillam March is best known for his ongoing extensive work with DC Comics on Batman, Catwoman and Harley Quinn and has worked as an artist on several graphic novels including English editions of Monica with Titan Comics and The Dream with Europe Comics. Here he takes up his pen for an edgy new five-part series about a highly unconventional angel named Carmen and the young woman she takes under her wing when a case of heartbreak strikes hard. Packed with surprises and metaphysics, this gorgeously drawn series deploys tenderness and humour as it dives deep into topics that matter. And coming up soon we have Headlopper number 15 from Image Comics. This is written and illustrated by Dan McLean. In this issue, Assassins of the Dark Lord close in on our team of heroes as they blunder towards the second artefact, the Martin Keystone. Guarded by a monstrously huge spider, the Keystone won't be easily got and requires much teamwork, which proves difficult when Norgal goes missing. Always oversized and always quarterly. Next up we have Sword number 4 from Marvel Comics. This is written by Al Ewing with art by Valerio Schilti. In this issue, Krakoa, we have a problem. The mutants are dying, their island is dying, Earth itself is dying. All hope for humanity as a species lies in Protocol 5. And Protocol 5 isn't going to work. This is another of the King in Black tie-in issues. And finally, Ultraman returns in Ultraman The Trials of Ultraman number 1 from Marvel Comics. This is written by Kyle Higgins and Matt Groom with art by Francesco Manor. In this issue, Ultraman narrowly averted a catastrophe decades in the making. The world was saved, but also forever changed. Now come the consequences. Much of the populace regard the defenders with suspicion. Enemies hide in plain sight, and even those closest to Shin Hayata don't necessarily have faith in the giant of light. But at last, a long-thought-lost comrade has mysteriously returned. That's a good thing, right? 
The rise is over. The training wheels are off and the stakes have never been higher. The trials of Ultraman begin here. As always, keep an eye on the Geeky Bummy Twitter feed on Wednesdays when I pick out a few other great comics available in On The Radar. And now back to the main show. So a recent release on Netflix was Space Weepers. This is a Korean f- space western, basically. Uh, regard It's been regarded as the first Korean space blockbuster and was released in Netflix, by Netflix just over a month ago, back in February. Uh, I, for one, really, really enjoyed it. So I set the team the task to go and watch it themselves and to hear thoughts back. For me, it reminded me very much of two of my favourite animes of all time, one of which is Cowboy Bebop, which is regarded as one of the greatest animes of all time, and a similar one called Outlaw Star, especially with the grappling ships, um, if anybody's watched that one previously. But I'd be interesting to hear your thoughts, and I'm going to start with... Lee. Okay. Um, so the first thing that sort of struck me with that is just how many languages that were in that movie. Um, and it got, it especially confused me because for some reason Netflix decided to start it as the dubbed version. So I had to change the settings to put it actually in Korean with subtitles. And then as soon as I did that, it was just a bunch of Western actors speaking English. <laughs> <laughs> Because you you had like you know Richard Armitage just giving yeah. his monologue immediately after that changing it to Korean, I was just like that's that's not Korean, <laughs> and and I was like but that voice even sounds really familiar, and then I realised yeah. oh it's Trevor Belmont in Castlevania, well, yeah, <laughs> and also Thor in from Lord of the Rings. Yeah, <laughs> you watch the if the watch the Hobbit movies. I think that just because Castlevania is so recent in my memory, yeah. that was the first thing I thought of. So, and actually, <laughs> yeah. good, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, like I actually really enjoyed uh, Space Sweepers. I thought it was just a really fun, like, just the the sort of ragtag band of of just people who just hate each other, <laughs> but also just can't get enough of each other as well. Like just the fact that we were introduced to the the whole team. With them basically at each other's throats, practically trying to kill each other. I was just like, I'm going to enjoy this movie. This is going to be fun. Um, yeah, just I, I just had a blast with that movie. Um, I don't think it was a particularly deep movie, but it was definitely interesting. Um, and I, I can't really think of anything I disliked about it. So just a good two hours of, like you said, anime-esque action, really. Mm-hmm. Um and I just, I just really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think as I said the anime vibe is very strong with this one. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, fair play to the movie for actually like having Korean in it rather than just doing the old you go anglicized thing of just having, as you mentioned, overdubs mm-hmm. as as the default. But actually having the Korean actors allowed to speak Korean in it and being able to mix around the voices a little bit because they yeah, do, do speak English as well in it. Because I do, I do like that you know they they added that plot device of like everyone's got like a translator that automatically translates everything, so just everyone's speaking in their native language. Yeah. Um, it just got especially funny with like the one guy who's clearly speaking some sort of patois, and like you can kind of understand what happened standing, but he's still got the subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, what what did you think about the film? Yeah, well, just on on that point of the whole languages, I think it's a big credit to the actors for being able to do that, being able to act so naturally around each other using different languages. Because there's obviously one bit um, with a sort of Frenchman and a Korean, uh, and just the way that they were just so natural. So you are there thinking that... it is like being translated straight away. So really good testament to the the actual acting. Mm -hmm. Um, I loved it. Uh, same sort of thing. I got a uh, similar kind of vibes to Cowboy Beat Pop, but also weirdly, um, Ultraviolet, if anyone remembers that film, um, in terms of the whole uh, child who could be used as a weapon kind of subplot thing, I just kind of got that kind of vibe. Um, but I think the only thing really was... It's a bit of a weird one. I kind of wanted to see a bit more space sweeping. <laughs> like they use it as like an introductory thing at the start, and then for the basically 
the large chunk of the rest of the movie, it's that they don't do that at all. And part of me was there being like, I kind of want to see more of it. <laughs> none, of, none of this world saving nonsense. I just want to see them doing their day job. I just, just want to see the like fling, fling rubbish about it. It just sounds really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is a film that moves at like 500 miles an hour. Yeah. And I think they try to like condense what could have been a mini series plot into one 90 minute, two hour movie. It's definitely a case of. Right, we've got the budget to do this, so we're going to condense all of our ideas into this and like not allow the world building to be there as much. Mm. I think it's fair. I think as well, um, sort of particularly sort of Bubs the android, I really enjoyed as a character because I think from the start, the personality was there, mm-hmm. um, and again, it just. They just did it right in terms of characterising, especially obviously doesn't have face really. He has a couple of sort of like emotions, but doesn't really have a face. So through the clothes, through the actions, through the body language, it was really, really good. Yeah. And can can I just say with 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 Bob's, there is just the design of it really reminded me of Nia for some reason. It's very <laughs> similar. To, it's very similar to the, the the machine designs in that in those games. And I've never yeah. even played the Nia games, but it was the first thing that jumped out at me. Yeah, it reminded me very much of a ancient webcomic, and I'm, I'm surprised if anybody knows this. Uh, there's a webcomic called Nine Planets with No Intelligent Life. Uh, I, I'll put the link in the show description because it is really worth a look at. To be I was genuinely worried you were going to say Control or Delete and the robot in that one. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no but basically, nine, nine Planets Without Intelligent Life as a slight survey is basically humanity got itself to extinction but the robots are like left across the um, solar system. And it's these two robots that get made redundant and their journey across the solar system. That's full of and we and great stuff. But the character design of Bubs is pretty much identical mm-hmm. to one of the robots in that. So I recommend that. But anyway, yes, back to the back to the actual thing. Keith, you've you've been quiet so far. <laughs> I just wanted to see what other other people um thought. It, it's it's again it's a, it's a weird thing that it must be something in the water because I'm currently reading a book, a comic book called We Only Find Them When They're Dead, which is by British writer um, Al Ewing, which has a, a similar premise initially um, with kind of um, space crews harvesting giant um, gods' bodies in the universe. So the kind of the idea of, of picking up junk and finding things to, to use in a resource um, lacking universe is quite interesting and there was a they have a person who's chasing them a little bit so it's like quite struck by how similar that idea was um mm-hmm. visually stunning absolutely looks amazing the, the the whole the the whole cgi uh and physical sets that they use are really good sells the world completely although i was a little i i kind of was constantly thinking this ain't going to happen in 70 years um you know it's like we're we're still years away from having electric cars so so constantly i'm thinking then we're never gonna have that spaceship we're never gonna have that but um and and the crew itself was quite interesting i kind of felt more drawn to bubs and uncle tiger strangely um the kind of lead to just didn't really have enough going on for me, they were kind of a bit thinly sketched with the idea of like there was some trauma in both their past lives. I think um, for those, I was waiting for the entire romantic subplot to like pop its head up for the entire movie, which yeah. didn't happen, which I was grateful for. But I, <laughs> but I think because I was expecting that, it's like, oh, they've just got the every man and every woman cookie cutter characters, and it's all going to be just about their romance, and that's it. Yeah. Mm. And there were some, there were some nice moments where they kind of subverted how the plot worked going on towards the end um yeah. with kind of like um bait and switch which they did quite nicely yeah. and i was kind of um slightly disappointed they didn't commit to one of the ending points that they had where yeah it looks like things have gone badly for the crew i kind of thought i like this is this is good that there's been some kind of sacrifice because we don't get a, that a lot in these kind of like yeah. high stakes um, kind of action pieces that like you know it seems like it's the end of the world and and things are really tragic but yet somehow everybody survives yeah um, and i was kind of like you've committed to that you've given me the fact that you've saved the person you need to save but to do so you've you've um 
committed the ultimate sacrifice and i was thinking wow that's pretty heavy going and kind of like i was going yeah. to applaud them for that and and again yeah. i could understand why they kind of like thought that would be a bit of a downer um for everybody uh which was really good and then what they do with the android at the end was really cool yeah. uh, i like the design work of the um cyborg police force which had a mm. little bit of the spectra and the other kind of the arrowverse film that you made us watch a few months back yeah uh, but again there wasn't there wasn't enough of like what what's all of that you know the, 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 you could see a human face but what, I wanted more of their backstory and I kind of wondered yeah. whether it would have been better as a series yeah rather yeah. than as a I film because think... there was an awful lot going on that you kind of want like I've get I've got to have I've had a glimpse of that but I kind of want to know more yeah um, I definitely I definitely kind of agree with that because it felt like there was a lot more to the world yeah. than what we saw like it feels like it feels like behind the scenes there's probably like I've thousands of pages just yeah. written about yeah. what the world is and how so, it all works and I'm, wanted, I'm curious yeah because i wanted more time on earth i really wanted to see all the, all of what was going on and it was kind of like there was no real threat to me when there's like the whole oh the space station's going to be dropped on the earth because we hadn't seen the earth enough mm -hmm. i think to like yeah. establish that danger and we if we had a few characters on earth as well and just got a side story that yeah. might have been useful and i think because the focus was solely on the main crew and there was no kind of b subplot yeah i think definitely it's it's something that you can tell it was probably a series idea that has been massively condensed down just because the cost basically but as you said the cgi is beautiful yeah. absolutely beautiful visual stunning film to watch and for something like this to be made and not be an MCU blockbuster movie. It shows you how far CGI has come on in the last twenty years. Yeah. Because to be honest, I I, I wasn't expecting something of that quality. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, I've I've seen like you know proper kind of yeah. blockbuster movies that where the effects didn't didn't work as seamlessly. Yeah. That it was rare. Yeah. In that that you kind of go, that's a little ropey. That that's a little um, yeah kind of not quite as good. As it could have well, been, it, it was yeah. it was a it was immaculately done, and the, you know the whole design aesthetic worked really nicely. The kind of contrast between the kind of junky, non UTC mm -hmm. um, environment, and, and then the kind of posh. Yeah. It, Please, in a way, it was yeah. a little bit like um, there was a film a few years back called Elysium, which had a similar mm -hmm. kind of idea. It was a um, Matt, Matt Damon, Matt Damon yeah, yeah um, with with the kind of like rich people in this other environments and, and going away so i kind of like that and, th and there was elements of the expanse in there and stuff as well and a bit of firefly so there was lots of kind of yeah. stuff in there that you could kind of hook onto um, yeah but i think it was it was it could have been longer it could have been a series so so I, there was there was a little bit of disappointment in the fact that i wanted i wanted more from that world and stuff because it speeds by quite quickly and things move and like matt was saying i like the idea at the beginning where you've got that competitive trash collecting which kind of gets jettisoned almost like yeah. we've done it once. We've shown you that like this is the best crew because they can outfly everybody and take the rest. Of but after that, it's like yeah, yeah, we forgot all about that and yeah. um, and stuff. So it, yeah, we'll do some more of that. It was definitely something that I wanted more of. But I want more of the before. I think rather than where the film ends. And I think mm -hmm. it's definitely like having a prequel TV series would have made a world of difference to that. The one th one thing that I, I was very disappointed with was Richard Armitage, the character. Yeah, he was very one one dimensional. He was yeah. one dimensional, but they made a mm. lot of the stuff of the kind of like at some point he's going to go explode out into some giant mutant monster because like <laughs> that's what my anime has given me in the in the mm -hmm. past is there's going to be somebody with weird veins who's possessed by something and is going to explode into a massive tentacled bug eyed monster, and I didn't get that. Which I was yeah. like, so that kind of thing was like. Okay, he's a hundred and something, but that didn't seem to lead anywhere. No. So it's like, why? Why was he having this thing? Why did he? You know, that didn't seem to be. It was almost as if there was a plot line that just got jettisoned for some reason that didn't pay off. Yeah, I, I would agree with that one. It's yeah. like every time that happened, I was like, oh, oh, where's this going? Yeah. And then it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, and I assume it's probably something that they dropped last minute through production just because of cost or timing or yeah. mm -hmm. no way to fit this in. Yeah, but um, it, it the world as well felt, as I said, unrealistically that it's going to happen. But it the the physics and the way they 
went around things, it felt realistic to more of an extent than like something like Star Trek would do, where it's all just phases and magical fast than light travel. Whereas there's like there's, there's some kind of thought of if you if you fire a rocket very fast, things happen. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. yeah. Slightly negated by the idea you can have an android sitting on your roof throwing harpoons across half of space. <laughs> That, that was that it's real to me, Derek. <laughs> As I was a kid, I get, I'm not quite getting the physics of this. Yeah, there were there were a few times where I was just like, "How is this robot not flying straight <laughs> off as soon as they accelerate?" <laughs> yeah, but uh, but Bubs, yeah, definitely the standout character for me. Mm-hmm. It was just so much fun to have something like that, and him and Uncle Tiger, I think, worked very well as a pair in the background. Yeah, yeah, but um. Yeah, we haven't really said anything about the uh, the little android herself. She has got him, his character. Dorothy. Dorothy. Well, yes. that's a, that was a, a... I can't remember what her, her real name is. But she's not Cotton. even an android, is she? She's just a nanite-infused nanite um, human being. Yeah. 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 There were a few convic- there was a few contrivances with that. She could control the nanites... And like in space, on the outside yeah. of the uh, the space, there's this bunch of like uncontrollable nanites. <laughs> like, yeah. That's that's mildly convenient. Um, yeah. But yeah. But again, this is all be- all because I think they just sped through so much story. Mm. And th- mm. there was there were little you know at points you were kind of like, I need th- yeah. there should there's more to this than than I'm being told and stuff. So yeah, I think ultimately for me, I think it was it, it erred on the side of like not being great was good. But mostly because I was left with all of these feelings of like, I want to know more about that. What's going on there? Mm-hmm. What was all mm-hmm. that thing with his veins? So I had a lot of questions at the end that I didn't feel that were yeah. resolved well. Yeah, I think we got like two or three major exposition dumps and that was about yeah. it. And we didn't really get a chance to warm to the characters because there's so much stuff going on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'd certainly yeah. go back to that world, you know, if, oh, if, they, yeah. if they kind of did a, either a series or another film. Yeah, um, I, I think I think I it. think uh, off the basis of this though, if if the criticism that you have of something is, I want to see more of this world, <laughs> it's not that being a criticism really. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we would all recommend this. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. If you've if you've got um, if you've got it, if you've got Netflix, it's definitely well worth a watch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, streaming on Netflix now, and if you can watch it as well as Dota at the same time. <laughs> but yeah uh, yeah it's, it's just great to have something like this easily accessible as well because again 20 30 years ago before netflix this would have been a korean only movie and probably would never come to the uk but i think having that world audience via netflix yeah. is it's great to see new stuff like this coming i think i think again it's that thing of like if this is what we can do for a netflix film and then yeah. Star Wars films are doing what they're doing. Star yeah. Wars have got to up their game. Really. Yeah. Well, considering this was made for twenty million pounds, and what was the budget of uh, the last Avengers movie? That's something like, like two hundred and fifty or something ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. So like twelve and a half times that. Yeah. For something of this good quality, something I'm definitely more hopeful for that these mid-budget movies. There's a lot more of those coming. I think it's also it's also set a good precedent for sort of like future sort of space Korean operas kind of thing. Um, but also in general, going back to the whole language thing, it's one of one of the only examples I know where it's presented in that way. So actually, this could be quite a good benchmark for other films to explore that kind of aspect or TV that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely, yeah. But yeah, I'm I'm more than happy to revisit that world if yeah. something else comes to it's a thumbs up from me mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so not only did I force you guys to watch one film over the last few weeks since we last recorded I forced you to watch two films one of which being a film that I loved around its release back in 2001 and it is a movie by Steve Odekirk uh, it is him self-inserting himself into a 1976 kung fu movie called Tiger, Crane and Fists. And it's, for the guy who wrote Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls, it's very much what you'd expect, that kind of level of humour. And 
Heath, you have opinions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I wondered if I'd ever seen this, and I hadn't. And whilst Space Sweepers was two hours and 20 minutes and flipped by in in very quickly, this was 80 minutes and seemed to go on forever. Um, <laughs> I think I bring a lot of baggage to, to this because I, I lived in a time when lots of um, Chinese kung fu movies and karate movies were coming to the UK badly dubbed. Godzilla movies were coming to the UK badly dubbed. But but I, I got a lot out of them, even though the dubs were terrible. This, um, whilst technically I thought was very good, the way they inserted uh, Steve into the various scenes, pretty seamless in most occasions, the odd one where it's kind of like a bit... Um, but I think for me, it kind of it didn't lean into its silliness enough. There were there were moments where they went, okay, there's there's bits we're going to do that have absolutely nothing to do with the the film we parried in. For example, as you can see now, the cow scene. <laughs> okay, so you know this, and then there's there's pyramid aliens later on. This is like if you if you've not seen it, it's, this is going to be there's a few the trailer coming. is like perfect against when you said yeah. that, just perfect timing. Um, <laughs> And but it, it just kind of it wasn't silly. It was I, I can imagine if you were under the influence with a group of other people, <laughs> it could be hugely entertaining. Watching yeah. it by myself uh, through through Disney Plus, where we, where it's available, it just kind of lacked a kind of cohesiveness. Really, it was it just seemed yeah. silly. I mean, Ali McBeal's baby at the beginning was like okay. <laughs> You know, a, a, a very good recreation of the bullet time from the Matrix, which yeah. again, kind of possibly at the time would have been like, oh yeah, cool, this is like the Matrix. It was only about two years later, yeah. um, but then just it, it, it was, it was, it wasn't silly enough, you know, and characters mm. just doing silly voices for the sake of doing silly voices, and oh, I think you know, and the tongue thing, what was that? The Chosen One. I mean, I've seen The Chosen One. That's an Eddie Murphy movie. The, the Golden Child. That's 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 how you do it. That's how you do parodies of like these kind of movies. Um, but it just seemed a bit random and kind of not well. Like the joke wore very thin very quickly. It was kind yeah, of like, I mean, yeah. I, it's like, yeah, I can see what you're going for. And this is cool. And it's the kind of thing that you could do yourself if you were at home watching a badly dubbed movie and you didn't really like it and you just made silly voices up about it. Yeah. Um, but it just didn't learn, lean into the silly enough. It was like, you know, we're going to have a character referring to himself as Betty and that's like that's going to be a big gag. <laughs> or there's going to be, you know, a woman turn up who's, who's slightly disproportionately endowed. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, either parody parody <laughs> or be silly silly. Yeah. It just kind of, it just didn't, and it all kind of went, I, we just gave up at the end and we're going to promise you a sequel that's never going to come. Um, and it was kind of yeah. like, I was I was just very disappointed. You talked it off as if it was the greatest film ever made. And uh, I, it just, I, I did 80 minutes, it, it was like the longest 80 minutes I've spent in a long time. <laughs> I was like, gosh, this, where, I think, is it going to ever end? Is, I think the thing is, it's definitely a film that you need to watch with at least one other person. Yeah. Or because several it, several cans of, <laughs> of stuff that you've, you've because already imbibed. Personally, I find it endlessly quotable. <laughs> My finger points. <laughs> endlessly quotable. If you go, wee 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 wee. No, no. This is like you know. Although, although the two gags that I did like. like he bought a lot of nuts. There, there were two gags I did like. The one where the woman picks up the baby at the beginning and goes, oh, cute, and then continues to chuck it down the hill. That was funny. <laughs> and I like the very end where the bloke goes, oh, you faded to black, but this eagle's still eating me. This, this isn't... Somebody do something about this. I thought that was funny. So um, the very start and the very end yeah, of the, the very film. start and the very end. And then the, next, the, the 79 minutes in between. <laughs> I'm sorry. But it, it just... It was just... Uh, it just it just didn't deliver as much as I would have yeah. liked from it. I, I think it's one of those where you have to definitely click with the humour that's on display. I mean, my favourite thing about the entire film, which nobody really ever notices, is the dog is badly dubbed. Because <laughs> the dog will bark, and then you'll get the noise three seconds later, and it's the funniest joke in the entire film for me. <laughs> because they always just like show the dog, and then it goes... Arr! 
It's that kind of stupid pig rahu that really just tickles my funny bone. I think <laughs> it's kind of it's, it's you have to. It's a film that you have to get fully involved with, and it's <laughs> definitely one where you need a, a few of you watching it, and maybe a little bit of alcohol or of the substances of not, choice. Not a little, a lot. <laughs> Matt, go on. You, you can help me defend this film. Because uh, I mean, it is interesting because I do love the film as well, but it's, it appeals to my my sense of humour because I am a child. Um, but also, I originally watched it um, with friends quite drunk at uni. Um, so again, I completely get what what Keith's saying. Um, and then when I watched it again, um, I watched it with my housemate. You know, we had the same sort of like sort of camaraderie. So, but I think it's it's a again, it's a funny film. Um, but also talking on what I found quite interesting watching it back was actually the technical aspects. It's really impressive the way he's actually inserted himself into everything and things like um, hit them. I was, I was reading up like facts afterwards and how he does the bad dub is the script is actually nonsense. So they'll speak nonsense and then he'll dub it over um, to get that kind of authentic like bad dub. And I think it's just that there's quite a few kind of nods to that kind of error. Obviously, that's kind of the point of it. But even the, the whole kind of like the, the fake sequel, it's still very Mel Brooks and his parodies as well. So I think it's it's by no means a work of art, but, it, but it's it's a good thing, a good fun thing to watch. And I will never get bored of the fight with the cow. Never. <laughs> I watched that and I was going, people had problems with Luke Skywalker doing that in kind of like the last Star Wars movie. It's like, this is nothing to what this guy gets up to. Well, it, it's even the stupid stuff like where the guy's with the boombox and just turns up at the back of each time Betty has a fight in the movie. <laughs> and it's always like a classic 70s rock tune like Black Betty. Did they <laughs> use that? MC Hammer at one point? <laughs> I mean, you know. I think I think as, as well, because like I think I think for me in my time, this would have been a film. If at my age, this would have been top secret. Yeah, which is probably the closest thing I would I would get to this in terms of that kind of parody silly things. It's a film uh, with Val Kilmer that came from the guys who did uh, Airplane, mm-hmm. which which is silly and it's silly yeah. with lots of visual gags, giant telephones, eyes in telescopes and stuff, and that that's. Another another funny movie that kind of this this film definitely fits into that kind of genre and timeline. Um, uh, but I just I think, think it, I just think it just wasn't silly enough. That was that was yeah. my that was my biggest takeaway. Was it's just like just yeah. go more stupid. <laughs> I think it's a timing thing as well because if I remember from my deep dark dusty childhood correctly, this was coming out when kung fu movies were back in popularity. You'd yeah. had Jackie Chan's like US fame here. So you'd had stuff like Rush Hour, we'd had the Matrix come out, you'd had stuff like Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon, I think was around this time. So it's yeah. kind of like that really big push for Hong Kong movies. I think it's meant that's an interesting thing off. now you've said that. Because it did in at parts it did remind me of some of those kind of like slightly comedic Jackie Chan movies that you got and the yeah. and the Sunny mm-hmm. um can't remember his his, his name, but where they played it a little bit for laughs, kind of slapstick yeah. type of stuff. So I could see that where they were reaching to with it. And I think some of those are the films that yeah. I, I enjoy well, more um, than this. What that... I was gonna, yeah. So what I was going to say off the back of that, I think that surge in American cinema was all these VHSs, for me especially, were becoming available for that first time. So this is the first time I could watch those 1970s, uh, Jimmy Wang Yu, Sammo Hung. Yeah, that's it. Um, Jackie Chan kind of films on VHS, which were all badly dubbed because they're all like Golden Harvest movies or Show Brothers movies or like these classic, classic Hong Kong martial arts movies, which we'd never got over the UK before or we'd had it, but then they'd got unpopular again. And then this was like what you'd go and find in Blockbuster. So you'd go and watch something like Armour of God or Police Story. And this was very much, I think, capturing that moment in time. And I think it's a very good take on how he's done that which is taking what was a very traditional 1976 hong kong movie very simple plot i actually watched tiger crane and fists 
in preparation for this film. And it actually doesn't stray too far from the plot itself, weirdly. <laughs> but um, I think the self-insert makes it so much funnier. And it's, it's, it is pretty much a combination of a Jackie Chan film with Ace Ventura and that kind of crossing over of that level of humour. And so you can this, see that from his writing style. So this is why I massively enjoyed it. Admittedly, I haven't re-watched it because uh, I just didn't get around to it. But I do have my memories of that film. But I think the time it came out was the exact perfect time for me because I was watching a lot of those really stupid parody movies. Like, you know, like Keith mentioned, like the, the Top Secret, The Naked Gun, the, those sorts of films. I was watching a lot of those and watching a lot of Jackie Chan films. And then that came out and I was like, well, this is both of those things. And so I think it definitely fit that kind of teenage yeah. era for myself of like, these are the things that I enjoy. And it is yeah. very much like, I think I was the perfect age for it as well when it came out. Because I looked it up and I was like 16, 17 or something when it came out. Yeah. And, that, and I think, yeah, that's the exact age. <laughs> I really struggled to watch Tiger Crowd and Fist because all the lines from Kung Pao just kept coming into my head. It's like it opens with Betty swinging his chain on the top of a waterfall and all that. And they going, here I am, swinging my chain. <laughs> <laughs> all the stupid stuff like that. Mm. But yeah, between me and my university friends, this was like the most quotable film that we ever had. Mm-hmm. It was it was that kind of, my finger points. Your clothes are blue. Your clothes are not red. <laughs> Beware her out his song about big butts. He'll kick your ass to it. <laughs> All that kind of stuff. And it's stupid. But I love that it's stupid. And mm-hmm. it's you can see that very much in its Rotten Tomato score, where every single critic thought it was probably the most awful film they'd ever, <laughs> unfortunately, laid their eyes on. And then in the audience ratings, it's at 69%, which it's not the greatest movie of all time. Of course it is. <laughs> of course, 69, nice, yeah. But it's kind of... You could see the appreciation from the audience that this was purely a stupid, funny movie to watch late mm-hmm. night on a Friday mm-hmm. after going out to the pub, get a kebab in, and on, put this on, and enjoy it. And it is interesting because, like, obviously, you're saying about you know it's incredibly quotable. Um, even though I hadn't rewatched it just the other night, I can't remember what led me to think of it, but it was the the. It's bad and it's wrong. It's, it's bad wrong. But dong. <laughs> <For dong. laughs> just, just that just popped into my head based off something else I was thinking about, and I was just like, "Ah, yeah." So that that shows how quotable it is that it just snuck into my brain. I, it's stuff sometimes like when I pick stuff up in my house, I go, "Hmm, memento." <laughs> it's like picks his booties off the floor. <laughs> I, I like think that. I've come to this film like thirty years too late. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's, my that's what I blame oh. you on. I just feel like we're, we're all sat here like laughing. Keith's just saying, like, have I watched the, the different film? Oh, I've, I've watched it. Like, <laughs> the version I've watched was totally different. <laughs> I mean, the whole joke about having the one fight when it trained wrong as a joke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like wind play. Yeah. But also yeah. like Moon Yu as well. Yeah. <laughs> the karate yeah. cow. Just... <laughs> you must be pretty strong to get past my cow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you even got the Lion King rip off halfway through it as well. Oh, yeah. completely but out. even doing the thing from The Simpsons and ending it with uh, "This is CNN." I think like, that was. Uh, I think Kung Pao did that first. To be honest, Pete. Oh, okay, okay. But at least in The Simpsons, they got James Earl Jones to do it. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I don't know. It's on Disney Plus. It's on Star. I mean, I think it's yeah. a seventy. Like, uh, we're pretty close on the Rotten Tomatoes score here. 75% positive and 25% <laughs> for the critics. <laughs> the, uh, uh, it's, I'm not going to be that harsh. I mean, you know, there's things in there to be enjoyed. Um, it just, it, again, it just didn't go far enough for me. It wasn't silly enough. Yeah. I, think. I mean, I will agree I will agree with you that it isn't very cohesive, but I also feel that that's kind of part of the charm of it, that it's just, it's like a weird <laughs> lost sketch show that's stretched out to feature length. Yeah. It's, just all it's, around. Like, it's mystery science theater 3k the movie i think it's all of the stuff that we would have probably looked if you'd watched that movie yourself and made jokes alongside it and yeah. then turn that into a film 
this is what it is, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's I watching think... that film for the first time and then going, well, I could make stupid references here. Yes, Mystery Science Theatre, if if the uh, if Mike and the bots put themselves into the movie rather than we're just <laughs> yeah. watching it in a, in yeah. a theatre. <laughs> and I don't think you can trust my judgement either, because I'm thinking, okay, if I was going to compare this to something that I really liked, and I'm going, yeah, I'm, t- I'm thinking about Vic and Bob's Weekenders, where you have <laughs> uh, Phil Oakley from... Um, Human League, Human selling League. them yeah. bacon in a field for no apparent reason. <laughs> um, I, th- I, th- I think, that, yeah, I, I, I have wildly um, <laughs> different kind of yeah. opinions. But yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's, if you've got an hour, uh, what, what, what technically is an hour and 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, is, it is worth a watch. I think everybody will get yeah. something from it. I think, you know, if you've... Um, yeah. If, you've, if you've had a drink and you need a laugh, I think you'll probably be all right. Yeah, I, I would say it's very much a audience movie, not a single viewer watching. Yeah, I think yeah, that, I think that watching it in this in just as myself, I think, yeah, it's it's the, it's that audience participation thing. It's like watching the room. Um, mm-hmm. You need you need other people. Um, yeah. To introduce you to it and and kind of be peppering it with their own yeah. um, bits. Yeah. And if you do watch it and it does click with you, we apologise in advance because it is one of those things that will get stuck in your head and occur randomly for the rest of your life. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the whole bit about the symbols as well, because it's like one of the symbols in the film, it's the MOT man symbol. <laughs> like when you get your car checked, that's all I could think every time I see that symbol. <laughs> yeah. The French aliens as well. <laughs> I mean, I thought that would hit your absurdist bone, Keith, having French aliens. But, but they did that. There's a bit where they're kind of a place, and there's like a little like 2000 AD style little alien that's just behind a bench or something, and then goes running off. Yeah, and it's like that's all. Sort of, you know, it's almost kind of Monty Python esque there. But I'm like, I was going, I want to know more about that alien. It's like, <laughs> can, can we just have a, a 20 minute diversion while we follow what he's doing? Because I, I know, I know, I know that yeah. he's just going to be off, you know, being the chosen one and kung fu fighting somewhere. That's fine. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm down with that. I've seen it. Um, I want to see more about I mean, aliens. Steve Odeke did say back in 2015 he had written the script for the sequel and he was trying to sort it out. I mean, do you think a sequel would work 20 years later? I mean, due to the absurdness of the film. I think it might work because it would like be perfect to represent the later Jackie Chan era. It was like his second surge of movies. I and, think like, it would work chosen one. if they riffed and parodied off things like John Wick, mm. uh, and you know that that would would you know even more uh, uh, bizarre killings. So he would, you mm. know, there's a real bad villain or something. Um, yeah. But, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, what did happen to the sequel? It's quite clearly there's clips from it at the end. <laughs> so what's going on with that? It's got a title and everything. <laughs> yeah. As you said, Lee, earlier, it's very Mel Brooks to me. I mean, would you recommend it to watch again? Let's go around in the circle. Keith, would you watch it again? <laughs> Not by myself. Not by Lee? myself. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Matt? Yes. With Keith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's it that's that's the yeah. correct answer <laughs> it's a definite watch again i think i think post lockdown we'll have to have a group viewing i think yeah. so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You, you can batter me into submission <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliance we'll, we'll bring a tiny net for you keith <laughs> yeah i can't, I can't have a tiny net <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the part of the show where I talk about my games of the week for the past three weeks. Two weeks ago my game of the week was Persona 5 Strikers for PS4, Switch and PC and is a sequel to the excellent Persona 5. And to shake things up a bit, it's been developed by Koei Tecmo's Warriors team, meaning this is, yes, a big old hack and slash, doing for Persona what Age of Calamity did for Breath of the Wild last year. But it is, in all essence, Persona 5.2 in its story and presentation, which breaks up its hack and slash gameplay with a handful of the usual Life in Japan simulator elements that the Persona series is known for. It looks stylish and fun, just like the game it's following on from, and should be a good time for Persona fans, which includes me, hence it being Game of the Week two weeks ago. Last week, Maquette for PC, PS4 and PS5 was Game of the Week. It is a puzzle game with a fascinating concept. The world is recursive, meaning that every object you interact with in the tiny dioramas within the world 
will also appear in the world you're standing in. Drop a block next to the replica of the building you're standing in and a massive block will drop immediately outside, you know, that kind of thing. It's an Annapurna published game and they have developed a reputation for finding small and expertly crafted emotional stories like Edith Finch and Outer Wilds and this looks set to follow in those footsteps. Definitely worth a look. And finally, this week's game of the week is Circuit Superstars, launching in early access on Steam. Technically this released last week, but it snuck out at the last minute and missed the roundup, and I wanted to feature it, because it's caught my attention more than any other games from this week. It's a top-down racing game, clearly calling to mind games like Micro Machines, but with more sim elements, so it's perhaps closer to last year's Art of Rally. It also covers a huge range of motorsports, including Rallycross and Super Trucks, with the small development team being huge motorsports nerds. It looks like a lot of fun, and if you're looking for a new racing game to try out, it's definitely worth checking out. And with that, let's get back to the main show. Welcome back. So, um, the last couple of weeks, uh, I've been going through and highlighting a couple of local geeky businesses in Birmingham uh, to kind of celebrate and to show that they are still open and still serving, um, be it not in a sort of physical capacity. Um, We've had sort of two so far and the latest uh, sort of countdown is live on our website so just gonna have a quick sort of rundown of what they are um so starting off we've got geek retreat so geek retreat is uh in the priory queensway during normal times it's a staple hangout for birmingham geeks it's a place to game it's a cafe it's a place to hang out and it's also a shop um mm-hmm. they are currently still open uh, for business online uh, geek retreat is actually quite a large brand in the uk so they've got quite a uh, lot of stock mostly it's trading cards so trading card games uh, like magic the gathering uh, Yu-Gi-Oh, pokemon that kind of thing but they do also have uh, some sort of warhammer 40k dungeon dragons a couple of board games and a few gaming accessories um in terms of uh, sort of buying online, you can either they can either deliver to you or they do a collection service. Um, so they're open weekdays, ten till five, and I think ten till six on a Saturday. Um, and it's one of those sort of like no contact uh, kind of setups. You'll go to the door, they'll, they'll give it to you, drop it off, that kind of thing. Um, Next up, we have Game HQ. So, Game HQ is quite an interesting one. It's a hidden oasis, excuse the pun, for geeks in the city centre. And it's based in the oasis, which is also another really cool alternative. Um, it's a fashion store, but inside it's got loads of independent vendors uh, from tattoos and quote books to jewellery to Game HQ. Um, Game HQ. They mainly focus on trading card games again, but recently their stocks have kind of expanded quite a lot to loads of other sort of like geeky paraphernalia, so mostly like figurines, um, uh, figurines, accessories, uh, clothes, that kind of thing. Um, one of the unique things about Game HQ, which I quite like, is um, they're very much a trading card geeks paradise because you can trade in cards um but also you can purchase particular cards to sort of expand your decks it's very good for those playing magic that kind of thing who want to keep up with the competitive scene and make sure their cards aren't out of date you can also trade in your older cards and get swapsies that way so it's really uh quite a awesome uh, sort of little hidden gem as it were in the city center they are operating online again um, it's best to really in terms of stock it's best to call them or check their instagram because from the looks of their website they don't seem to have as much as uh, they actually do offer and plus um, their stock rotates all the time so if you're looking for something quite um, particular it would be best to go through that way um, they are again online delivery or collection and again it will be a sort of no contact uh, collection and with the deliveries it's free if it's over 30 pound or it's one pound 50 if it's just under so still quite reasonable still cheap than amazon <laughs> and um 
the last one is Forbidden Planet is your kind of run of the mill staple geek shop. Uh, so it's got everything from uh, figures, toys, that kind of thing, to underneath in the bottom floor, it's got board games and uh, floor to ceiling comics, comics and manga. Um, they have a huge stock, uh, one of the largest uh, stocks in the UK, um, and it sells just about everything you can sort of feasibly think of. Um, to for them, they do a twenty four seven delivery service, so they're online twenty four seven for purchase. Okay. They only do delivery; they're not doing collection at the moment. Um, but like I said, they're probably your best place to go if you've got disposable income and you want to sort of scratch that geeky itch. And they've got large stock, so if they don't have it, they'll probably be able to get it in. All of those are based in the city centre, uh, so hopefully, fingers crossed, if everything opens back up again quite soon, you'll actually be able to go out and see them in person. But yeah, that is it for this this week. And it's probably the best place that you can go and pr- practice your social awkwardness post lockdown. <laughs> that's the kind of like the customer base is going to be perfect for like people who don't really want to interact with people in the shop, <laughs> of which I am one of them. I think that's one of the most important things, really, because a lot of these they're more than just retailers, they're geeky spaces, they're spaces for a lot of people, safe spaces as well. Um, <laughs> so kind of part of the reason of this is supporting them because they are a massive part of the Birmingham geeky scene yeah and all nine retailers that you've highlighted over the past few months uh, all staff are usually so overwhelmed with knowledge when you're asking questions about stuff and it's perfect for for people who aren't probably geeky themselves these are the places that you'd recommend to them to like go and pick up stuff for you because they could like you could give them a couple of hints on oh I like this particular franchise, and this is a good shop, and this is a great way for other people to go and shop on your behalf to say, right, I have my friend here who's very much into Star Star Wars the original movies. What have you got in stock? And these retailers will know exactly what they're into, into or like Magic the Gathering or Pokemon TCG, anything like that. These are probably really good places to hit up. So you can find all the information on the Geek Premier website. And again, link will be in the description for the latest issue. Thank you for joining us on the Geeky Brummy podcast this week. Matt, where can we find you online? Uh, you can find me on Instagram uh, at Matchstick Matt, um, or you can find me on Twitter at Mr. Matt Lovell. Uh, you can now find me tweeting from the Geeky Brummy handle on a Monday about genuine sort of geeky stuff and occasionally rant about esports and um, I also do the weekly roundup with Lee uh, on a Friday on the website Awesome Lee, coming on to you, where can we find you online? Uh, you can find me on YouTube at Bob the Pet Ferret where I do an assortment of different gaming videos um, the most recent one would be the my opinion on Hollow Knight now that I finally played it and I see whether or not it lives up to the hype uh, you can also find updates on that channel on Twitter at Bob the Pet Ferret, and I tweet generally at the Cheap Ferret. Uh, I've also set up a Discord community uh, for the channel. Uh, link, there's a link to that on the actual channel page because I'm not reading it, the link to that because it's <laughs> it's loads of players and numbers. <laughs> but awesome, yeah. And your Medium video also released recently. Yes, I also did a re- recently did a video on the medium and why it's split opinions because you know i had to get the pun in there somewhere um <laughs> and then uh yeah like as as matt said the gaming roundup on friday on geekybrummy.com and uh, awesome. i do the sort of news and releases well matt covers the esports awesome and uh, keith where can we find yourself online the next place you'll find me online will be at some supermarket ordering, ordering copious amounts of beer to enable a rewatch of Kong Pao. <laughs> uh, so I think I did it wrong the first time. Uh, but what I think you really mean is where am I going to be? And as you can see, if you're watching, hard luck underscore hotel uh, for kind of nonsense, occasionally um, some opinions. And then Wednesdays as a retweet channel for me on the Geeky Brummy Twitter <laughs> talking about comics. Uh, and then on a Wednesday on the blog site as well with a, a roundup and some more extra news that I can't 
squeeze into the 280 characters on Twitter. And you can find me at Ryan Parrish on Twitter, where it's a barren wasteland of zero content. <laughs> uh, you can find me on Brummy Gourmand at Twitter, which is currently lots of memed gifs about cooking competitions, mainly about how somebody looks like an egg and is a talentless judge and should never have been hurt. I just realised that the tongue in Kung Pao looks a bit like Greg Wallace. It does. <laughs> <laughs> It's all cyclical. It's, 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 it's all, all connected. Yeah. <laughs> but as you mentioned, you can find content on geekybrummy.com regularly. I've been doing Wonder Revision kind of reviews, kind of spoiler free walkthroughs for those who have not watched it on Disney Plus yet. You can find it on there and our final thoughts on the series for those of us who watched it. Uh, you can find as I said, on Wednesday's Keith's Comic Roundup, on Friday's Lee and Matt's Gaming Roundup slash Esports Update. Uh, and don't forget to follow us on all the usual social medias. Do please do the like, subscribe. I know I hate everybody hates saying this, but we have to say it. Like, subscribe, share, tell all your friends, write a comment, just do something if you've enjoyed the show at all and promote us. And it's really helpful. It doesn't cost you anything. Just a click is always useful. And thank you for that. God, I hate doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to write it into every one of my scripts on YouTube, and I also hate doing that. <laughs> but thank you very much for joining us, and we'll hope to see you again soon. But for now, goodbye, everybody. Bye. I will see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>